Okay, I guess we better get started because we have a full program. Um, let me first of all welcome you all to today's fourth, actually, uh, EMA lecture, uh, a series we introduced as a new way of outreach within um, EMA. And we usually will connect these lectures to um, specific um, days like the World Soil Day or the World Day of um, Food Loss and Waste. But today we want to focus on something else. It is about finding common ground. And uh, I have the great pleasure um, to um, welcome many representatives of two um, befriended organizations um, here today, um, meaning um, ELFEM and also EXARC, and also have the great um, opportunity to now hand over to our moderator of the day, which is um, Carrie Lee Birchall. And uh, she um, not only um, is an EMA member, but also an uh, ELFEM board member, um, but also um, um, has this um, broad insight into possible um, ways all of these um, organizations could interact with each other. So I'll hand over to you, Carrie Lee. Uh, merci, Klaus. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, bonjour, guten tag. Uh, my name is Carolee Birchall. I am the Director General of the Canada Agriculture and Food Museum, uh, which is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people uh, here in uh, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. I uh, use the pronouns she and her, and for any of the participants today that may have visual challenges, I am a middle-aged uh, woman with dark hair that is rapidly graying, uh, and I am wearing my reading glasses uh, this morning, which is becoming more and more commonplace for me. I wanted to uh, thank Klaus very much for the honor of, of uh, being the moderator today. I, as Klaus mentioned, I am a, a longtime member of AIMA. Uh, I'm proud to say that I've been working with AIMA since uh, 2009, 2010. Uh, I am a, currently a board member with the ALFAM uh, organization. Um, I'm working on their communications committee as well as their future sites committee. And uh, I am a longtime fan of the EXARC website. Uh, and if uh, Roland will permit me, I, I highly recommend if you haven't done so already uh, to check out their website and, and uh, a big shout out to their uh, reading corner that has a fantastic section on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I wanted to uh, just perhaps share a little bit why, why it meant so much to me to be asked uh, to be moderator for this session. Uh, as a, you know, a, a director of a National Museum of Science and Innovation uh, that is also an open air site and just happens to also have a working farm um, as a, a large part of its programming mix, um, I can attest to the benefits of, of being a member of international associations that uh, provide communication channels uh, for big issues, uh, for crisis management, um, for evolving visitor expectations. Uh, I think this was really highlighted for me most recently at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, at that point, I was uh, Secretary General for AIMA and was given a very early heads up by some of our, our AIMA colleagues in India and Europe um, as to the growing concerns around uh, the pandemic, what that might mean for museums having to shut their doors, what that was meaning for cities and populations that were having to adapt. And that early warning was key um, in my organization's success in cross-training some staff very quickly of making sure that we had our, our animals and sites uh, well in hand before uh, we actually had to officially shut the doors. Uh, and I think that that type of uh, communication channel, that ability to tap someone on the shoulder um, and ask, you know, how they're handling a crisis or, you know, what, what they're finding in their neck of the woods uh, is invaluable when you're working on um, a museum site that uh, may be contending with live animal care, that may have partnerships in the communities that serve vulnerable, vulnerable populations. Uh, so I'm, I'm just absolutely thrilled um, to be here to uh, moderate the session with uh, AIMA, with ALFAM and with EXARC today. And so um, 
with that, I will not take up any more time with my moderator's notes because I know everyone's here to hear from the, uh, specifically from the three associations. So we're gonna turn this over first to Roland. Roland Parta Cooper is one of the original founders of Exarch. Um, he has uh, quite a bit of experience as museum manager um, and with a particular specialty in archeology. span And so uh, Roland, I'm going to turn it over to you for your presentation. And uh, I'll just let everyone know before Roland starts that we will have uh, questions being entertained in the chat function. So if you'd like to post a, a question, n'hésitez pas si vous voulez formuler vos questions en français. I certainly can handle French uh, and English and I will count on some of the illustrious colleagues uh, here. If there are questions in other languages that come up, we will do our absolute best to, to answer all of those from the chat. So Roland, without further ado, over to you. Thank you for joining. Let me first introduce myself. My name is Roland Paardekoeper and I'm an archaeologist, museum manager. I grew up in archaeological open air museums and studied archaeology in the Netherlands and in the UK. I worked in the Netherlands, Germany and currently as a museum director in Denmark at the Medieval Centre. If I talk about Exarch, I refer to a broad international network and we have four themes. First of all, there are these archaeological open air museums. We work with experimental archaeology, with ancient technology and with interpretation. And if you think that's very broad, then I would say look at it as it revolves around archaeology, open air, reconstruction, living history, life interpretation, those kind of subjects. We were founded in 2001. We were registered in the Netherlands and I'm one of the founders. And we grow fast, so I think we now have members in more than 40 countries, more than 400 members. A good part of that are museums, organizations, but the largest part are what I call professionally interested people. Those can be freelancers, or not. We have quite a large number in the German speaking part of Europe, German, Switzerland, Austria, similar part in the UK and Ireland. Uh, North America is also quite large with us and following from that are Italy and, and other parts of Europe. We also have members abroad outside Europe. There are about 13 higher education centers most of them are universities. Uh, think of the universities of York, Madrid, Exeter. We also have open air museums member uh, like Batzer Ancient Farm, Salzburg Roman Museum in Germany, and Land of Legends in Lyra in Denmark. And of course, we have a lot of individual members, and many of them are working at universities or museums. These museums are referred to as archaeological open air museums, and, and I would consider them as a well thought through scenery with reconstructed buildings and items based as much as possible on sources and their interpretation. The activities are more important than the houses, and the stories we bring are not just for children. And indeed, we tell stories relevant to modern day visitors, so they can reflect on the past to learn for the present. We are creative, but it's not just fantasy. It's very hands-on. The exhibition in our museums is not behind glass. We include the visitor actively. And it goes in depth, depending on the visitor. Uh, you don't just learn, for example, how to make fire, but we teach people problem-solving strategies in a different way than you would learn in formal education. Experimental archaeology is an important part of Exarch, and we want to help people not to reinvent the wheel each time. So we, for example, have a bibliography with over 13,000 titles on experimental archaeology online. And here you can find experiments and, and then you know if something has been done already and what you can learn from that. There are also many people who can help. 
And we are a great source for materials and resources. Think, for example, of birch bark from Finland. It's a very diverse field, this experimental archaeology. Um, it's about construction of buildings, about ceramics, about education, about iron smelting, textiles, also the more scientific or uh, laboratory way of use wear analysis. So it's a very diverse field. But we don't only work with that, we also work with ancient technology. And that is uh, presenting crafts and techniques we know from the past purely as technique. So it's not in Stone Age costume, for example. And if you compare it with uh, survival, then there the past serves mainly as inspiration, but the context is less important. But for us, with ancient technology, we always keep the context of time and space. Finally, interpretation. And, and I think that's one of the most important things within Exarch. Uh, you can look at it uh, from Tilden's perspective from the 50s, uh, where it's a mission. There's a message to convey. It, it includes, of course, living history, reenactment, etc. And of course, Tilden's definition is important, but we look at it a bit more widely, so to say. And if we look at Intel's, Intel Europe's definition, then it's any live interaction between museum or site staff and their visitors. It's about how you convey the story to the visitor. It includes everything from the guided tour by the educational staff member or the guidebook or the signs on your museum, the app, also the social media or the website. So it actually includes living history, museum theater, HEMA, that's Historical European Martial Arts, also parts of LARP, not everything of LARP, of course. And each of these methods of interpretation require another approach, often also for different target groups. Well, talking about interpretation, there are three conditions. You need to use competent people. It's important to encourage questioning. And it's about verification of scripts. And each interpreter is a combination of a bit of a teacher, a bit of an archaeologist or historian, and a bit of an actor. It's about promoting curiosity, this encouraging questioning. And the verification of scripts, that's something the museum or the site should control, that whatever is presented fits within their interpretation framework. Now, let me talk about Exarch. Uh, I usually start by saying our official language is English. And that sounds very straightforward, but it's not so straightforward in a group of people from 40 different countries, where most of them don't have English as their native language. We use a lot of volunteers, actually mainly volunteers, and we have an exceptionally large website, I think with more than two and a half thousand pages, um, almost half a million visitors per year. It includes presentation of all our, our of all of our foreign lab members, their most important events, all in English. Uh, we have an online journal with 400 articles, which is open access, and I think that's very important to emphasize. Everything with Exarch is as much as possible open access, and if it's online, it's free. So our journal. It's, it's one of our pearls, I would say. We publish it four times a year online. It's serious. Articles are peer reviewed. We have persistent identifiers. It's also open access, but it's not from an ivory tower. It's usually very practically applicable information and everybody can publish with us. A selection of these articles from the online publication is published on paper in a hard copy journal, because of course online is not everything. And it has short versions of articles, uh, it's published once per year. Uh, our members receive that as uh, something extra. It also goes uh, to conferences where we, where we are present. So uh, that's a nice little yearbook or hard copy journal. We have an online reading corner with, for example, overview of more than 500 archaeological open air museums worldwide. Most of them are in North America and in Europe. And you can use this as a travel guide. 
whether you sit in your comfy armchair or whether you're really traveling, it's an interesting start. We also have podcasts and we usually invite two speakers, both working with the same theme, a bit overlapping, say for example, experiments with fire in archaeology, and they discuss this from their different backgrounds. These are all again open access and you can find them both on our website and on the main uh, podcast uh, platforms. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are quite important to us. Uh, this doesn't only refer to museums, it also refers to our individual members. And we have a large part on our website where we offer examples on how to work with these in a very straightforward way. We cannot save the world all by ourselves, but we all can make some steps, and this is a perfect theme for cooperation. One of our older parts on our website is uh, the House of Questions, where we answer the 200 frequently asked questions in archaeological open air museums. Most of these are very straightforward, again, about the daily life in the past. This is exactly what you expect archaeology to answer. We are very much a network. Uh, we have the Experimental Archaeology Award, where uh, there's 500 euro for a good experiment, thanks to one of our members. We have the Retool project, which is about open air museums, the documentation, digitization, and sharing of their collection and stories, which is not just for the members of the project, but we aim on more open air museums or museums in general in the world. There's a project called Putting Life into Late Neolithic Houses, where under the leadership of the University of Leiden, we question the images archaeologists and the public have about life in the Neolithic and aim to come with so better images. We also stand with Ukraine, where we try to use our network to include colleagues from the Ukraine in different ways, information, contacts with uh, with people on, on, on in other countries, so they can continue their work uh, uh, where it involves our themes, XR themes. We have a uh, cooperation with Colonial Williamsburg, where about once a year, somebody is selected to spend a month there and wor work with, with their themes. Uh, the European Archaeology Days uh, is, uh, is important to us. It's usually mid-June, where uh, a lot of museums across Europe uh, are open to the public, have special activities. We cooperated with the Mammoth Museum in Austria. We put together a traveling exhibition on experimental archaeology in English and in German with examples from around the world. And finally, we also have NEMO, the Network of European Museum Organizations, uh, where we are, where we work together uh, in European museums, uh, so to say. Also, we have ICOM, the International Council of uh, Museums, uh, where we are also very active. But it's not just that online. Not everything is online. We also meet in real life. We have a large calendar of events happening with our members or of other places which are interesting and fit with our themes. This goes from France to Croatia, from the United States to India, from Norway to Germany. There are a lot of events, not just festivals, but also conferences, textile forums, uh, whatever you think about. Of course, also Alfam and Aima conf annual conference are on our list. It's a, it's a source of inspiration. And we have our own conferences. Uh, we organize something every year, but biannually, so every second year, we have an international conference on experimental archaeology, EAC. And we held it recently online, for obvious reasons. And the 170 presentations which were presented there in four days are still available online at YouTube and on our website. The next EAC conference will be hybrid where the in real life part will be early May 2023 in Poland and a part will be online. So 
what does Exarch offer? Well, we are a specially international network of resources. It's for you to push the button and start using it. We have materials, literature, people, museums, ideas. We try to offer the link with the science behind our themes. And we are very much an open network through our social media, through our website, our meetings, our, our everything really. And, and we are very interested in international global cooperation to activate more of that network. And an important common theme for us are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. But it's also about living history. It's also about agriculture, breeding ancient types of animals, open air, and all of this link between ALFAM, EMA, Exarch, Intel, and other organizations. If you appreciate good neighbors and far friends, I can tell you, we have both. You can ask me anything or just check our website at exarch.net. Thank you very much. That uh, was excellent, Rolinda. It's such a good overview, not only of, of Exarch, but I, I believe also your, your mission and mandate. I uh, What really resonated the most for me was uh, you know, the, the focus not only on heritage preservation and, and the research, but how important that interpretation is with context around time and space. And, and that uh, that will resonate with, with any audience when you're trying to spark their curiosity. Um, I think we can all attest to the fact that, we, you know, most of us have interesting sites, but your, your statement that activities are far more important than the buildings themselves, I think. Um, is, is what we will take with us as we go into the next presentation. We will be entertaining questions at the end. Roland, was there anything at this point that you'd like to, to add in addition to the presentation? No, I, I think we can take it later in, in a joint discussion. I'm not so much interested in telling what we are doing, but I'm more interested to hear also what the others are doing and what the ideas are from the public. Fantastic. Well, with that, we'll move on to our second presentation. We have uh, Jim Lauderdale uh, on, on queue. He is the uh, Vice President for the Association of Living History, Farming and Agriculture Museums. Uh, and we also have Kathy Dixon online, who is the current president. Uh, Jim is going to walk us through a, a PowerPoint um, and, and narrate that. Uh, he has 11 years of experience uh, probably more than that, uh, managing museum sites. And uh, he smokes by far the best bacon I've ever tasted. So I <laughs> encourage everybody to listen attentively as uh, Jim walks us through his presentation. Uh, thank you, Carrie Lee. I appreciate that introduction. Um, let me just get to share screen. There, uh, Klaus, if you can give me a thumbs up if you can see that, okay? All right. Thank you. Uh, so hello to everyone, and thank you for joining this digital lecture today. Um, as Carrie Lee said, my name is Jim Lauderdale, and I am working as the museum director for Fort Nisqually Living History Museum in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, I also want to say a quick thank you to Klaus for hosting and putting together this digital lecture. Uh, this is a pretty exciting opportunity for ALFAM to be able to collaborate with IEMA and EXARC. So we appreciate this opportunity. The Association for Living History, Farm and Agricultural Museums, or otherwise known as ALFAM, is an international organization of people who bring history to life. ALFAM's mission is to serve those involved in living historical farms, agricultural museums, and outdoor museums of history and folk life. Since its founding in 1970, ALFAM has been at the forefront of the growth and professionalization of the use of living history techniques in museum programs. ALFAM members and member institutions can be found across the United States, Canada, and in many other countries. The Association for Living History, Farm, and Agricultural Museums began when 23 like-minded individuals met on September 17, 1970, 
during the Agricultural History Society Conference at Old Sturbridge Village in Sturbridge, Massachusetts. They represented diverse perspectives interested in a vibrant new breed of museums, living history farms. And they decided that they wanted to continue to communicate and meet on a regular basis. So they wasted no time in doing just that. The Association for Living Historical Farms and Agricultural Museums, which was Alfam's original name, was organized on November 20th, 1970, and the first issue of the Living Historical Farms Bulletin, now the Alfam Bulletin, was published on December 1st, 1970. Dr. John T. Schlebecker, Curator of Agriculture and Forest Products at the Smithsonian Institution, along with Wayne Rasmussen, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and Ernst Christensen, National Park Service, signed the Articles of Incorporation in April 1972. By the time Alfam convened its second meeting, at the Farmers Museum in Cooperstown, New York in 1972, Alfam was incorporated in the state of Maryland. The founders pledged to encourage research, publication, and training in historic agricultural practices, facilitate the exchange of agricultural information and items, develop a genetic pool of endangered agricultural plants and animals, sponsor scholarly symposia and publications dealing with agricultural history, accredit living historical farms and agricultural museums, and foster in, in present and future generations an appreciation and understanding of the ideas and ideals which have contributed to the greatness of American agriculture. Alfam set a standard in the museum field because of its advocacy of using reproductions rather than originals in museum programming, of systematically collecting and preserving living history collections, which were stocks, stock and crops, and of sharing findings broadly. Publications such as Living Historical Farms Handbook by John T. Schlebecker and his research assistant, Gail Peterson, and articles published in the proceedings of Alfam's annual meeting by Darwin Kelsey and Edward Hawes provided theoretical information about conceptualizing living history farms. Others provided practical nuts and bolts ideas about managing them. From the beginning, however, Alfam appealed to many not working in farm and agricultural museums. Alfam survived and prospered because its members recognized the need to evolve as the field changed. As Terry Scherer recounted at the 20th anniversary meeting in 1990, many of the 23 founders were economic historians. But soon, folklorists joined and dragged the agricultural economists into discussions of foodways and planting by the moon. Then, living history reenactors impressed their notions of interpretation on everyone. Out of such growth emerged the regional groups that provided additional opportunities for Alfamers to network at the local level. By 1997, Alfam members debated the merits of a name change to reflect the greater influence of living history on interpretation beyond agricultural history. The Al family remained committed to its anachronym, but agreed that adding a comma in the name could expand the audience served in major ways. Another characteristic of Alfam that has ensured its survival, according to Terry Scherer, is the multidisciplinary nature of the organization that helps members 
display their ignorance in a positive way. We seem to enjoy one another's curiosity. We have investigated the past from perspectives of archaeology, geography, material culture, biology, and other ways because we wanted to know something. And we didn't let disciplinary or professional, professional posturing stand in the way. Alfam's commitment to professional development reflects the multidisciplinary nature of its members and the range of museums served. In keeping with the name change, our purposes have broadened. Today, as Edward Baker so aptly phrased it, Alfam is an international organization for people who bring history to life, open to all people and institutions interested in living historical farms, agricultural museums, and outdoor museums, including but not limited to history, folk life, and agriculture. To reach its constituents, ALFAM provides a forum for communicating the various ways to interpret history, including but not limited to agricultural and rural life. ALFAM does this by using the ever evolving means and modes of museum interpretation as the state of the art permits. The ALFAM annual meeting and conference is the largest single gathering of the AL family hosted each year by a member institution in the United States or Canada. The format includes formal papers, interactive workshops, the annual business meeting, site visits, and multiple opportunities for informal discussion. Sharing, fun, and learning go hand in hand at this meeting considered by many to be one of the most useful museum conferences available. In 2020, ALFAM celebrated its 50th anniversary amid the COVID-19 pandemic. We had been looking forward to this annual meeting and conference in Boston with the inspiring theme, Vision 2020. Unfortunately, the pandemic brought about changes that none of us could have imagined. Not only was the association affected, but of course, so were our members. The doors to our museums and farms were shuttered. Our parking lots were void of school buses making their annual spring visits. And sadly, many of our colleagues became furloughed or unemployed. The Alfam board was faced with the difficult decision to cancel our Boston conference along with many other regional meetings and workshops. That summer, the International Council of Museums suggested that one in 10 museums might not reopen, and the American Alliance of Museums reported that one third of museums would not survive the year. The outlook seemed grim at best. However, instead of an historic in-person conference, we held our first ever virtual conference. It was during this time that we began to learn from museums who were beginning to offer virtual programming, encouraging audiences at home to engage with items found around the house. We observed other organizations handing over their social media to security staff and mascots. Alfam also began thinking of how we could continue to serve our members. It was discovered that we could engage our communities all while remaining socially distanced. Our members discovered new ways to collaborate, adapt, and use resources to their advantage. New tools were utilized to help us navigate digital platforms like the ones that brought us together for a successful online conference in 2020. Our organization learned that over three days, we could explore topics of sustainability, inclusion, and diversity and make a difference in our own communities. The strength of our members shone bright as thought-provoking sessions demonstrated our core values. Our organization made a commitment to renew efforts to reach out to new audiences. In addition to this, we were inspired to collaborate, cooperate, overcome adversity, and strengthen our members by our actions in the future. 
To accomplish these goals, we use several different tools. First, the association offers its members the ALFAM Skill and Knowledge Base, otherwise known as ASK. ASK is a digital information system that unifies and shares an extensive collection of reference works, training materials, and other resources of the Association for Living History, Farm, and Agricultural Museums. A keyword search of ASK puts 25,000 documents and other ALFAM resources at our members' fingertips. The system currently contains all of the articles from the ALFAM proceedings, published versions of presentations from our annual conference, and all ALFAM bulletin articles from 2005 to present. It also includes the content of the ALFAM website, the complete archive of the ALFAM L, which is our email discussion list, and material provided by ALFAM members such as Tillers International and Howell Living History Farm. ASK will soon contain regional conference presentations, professional interest group materials, and video clips recorded during skill training programs and workshops. Next, ALFAM prides itself on supporting skills, training, and preservation. The Skills Training and Preservation, STP, Resource Center provides information and tools useful in the preservation and perpetuation of skills, practices, processes, systems, and arts presented through living history. ALFAM members can carry countless exceptional skills into the field, forges, houses, and workplaces where they bring history to life. And so the STP initiative documents the skills, practices, processes, systems, and arts they preserve and shares them through training, resources accessible to all members. A permanent ALFAM board committee and online resource center support this organization-wide STP initiative to guide the work of teaching, learning, and perpetuating skills the STP initiative embraces the following goals. To develop unique, relevant, and quality skills training opportunities for members, document living history skills in a format that they can be shared widely, and ensure long-term success to and preservation of documented resources. The STP committee works with all board committees, regional representatives, professional interest groups, and members to ensure that the skill-related needs, opportunities, and documenta documentation projects are inclusive, broad-based, and accessible to all. To reach our members, ALFAM uses both traditional print and electronic media to address as broadly as possible the issues faced by, our, by staff in living history, farm, and agricultural museums. All ALFAM members receive the quarterly ALFAM Bulletin as a benefit of membership and are eligible to join ALFAM's email discussion list, the ALFAM L. Members can access the online volumes of the proceedings. The indices of proceedings and bulletin are accessible to all, and several infrequent publications, including a guidebook to ALFAM institutional members and bibliography of past bulletin articles, from 1970 to 1986. Printed issues of the bulletin are no longer available, but members can read bulletins online. ALFAM is building a library of skills clips, session and webinar videos on YouTube, as well as links to member videos to provide skill training and continuing education for its members. The ALFAM Skill Clip Library contains short instructional videos of a skill or technique from the past. These videos can be used for reference, understanding, or brief information before discussing or trying at your own institution. ALFAM has also partnered with Look Around You Ventures to provide videos from the Civil War Digital Digest and Revolutionary Gazette 
which has produced a series of videos that promote historic farming, trades, skills, and the institutions that preserve and promote their memory. And then Alfam also hosts a member video page, which links Alfam members' video pages and channels like YouTube. These resources feature members at their best, whether they are historic sites, agricultural museums, historic houses and farms, individual interpreters, or business serving the living history community. Many Kim? of our, sorry, Carrie Lee, were you trying to say something? Well, I was just going to let you know that um, we're, we're quickly running out of time given it it's such a tight session. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on the time. Thank you so much. Many of our members find in-person gatherings to be useful opportunities. So we offer regional meetings and conferences as an opportunity for those people to come together. We also uh, offer skills workshops and encourage skills workshops for people to come together and learn those hands-on skills uh, in person. Alfam's members have also come together to form professional interest groups, otherwise known as PIGS. And PIGS are an informal gathering of Alfam members interested in exploring and sharing information on specific topics and skills. Like most organizations, Alfam wants to offer support to its members and member institutions. And so to accomplish this, the board of directors drafts a strategic plan that runs for two years. The most recent plan for 21 to 23 has four different goals, which since we're short on time, I won't read, but I will mention that at our fall board meeting, uh, the board did review each of the four goals that has been developed by Alfam and de determined that some of these goals have been achieved while others uh, have had setbacks due to the pandemic. So we will be drafting uh, a new set of goals in the next strategic plan uh, within the coming year. So thank you. I hope that you have found this presentation to be helpful and that you've learned a little bit about Alfam. And I do look forward uh, to your questions at the end of the presentation. And I will stop share. Well, thank you, Jim, uh, for the presentation. Uh, Jim mentioned Al Family, which is uh, how uh, Al Fam members are affectionately uh, known. That that goes beyond a moniker to really, uh, I think, capture the the sense of um, the sense of of belonging, of community, of practice that that's amongst that membership. So. Uh, I can certainly attest to the fact that the, the support and the professional development opportunities with Alfam have been uh, tremendous. Klaus is up next. Uh, given that we've had a couple of technical glitches, we're running a few minutes behind. I'm not going to delay any further. I will ask Klaus to start his presentation, but I will give everybody a heads up that we, we might go about 10 minutes over. So I'm hoping people can stay with us. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Klaus Krupp, and I am the current president of the International Association of Agricultural Museums, or short, AIMA. With this short presentation, we want to introduce our organization to you, highlight our mission, as well as our focus group, and share, basically, our plans for the future with you in order to see where to find common ground with the other organizations represented in this lecture. We will start off with a little introductory video, a promotional clip, so to speak, of AIMA itself. Barbara Sosic, 
and I work at the Slovenian Ethnographic Museum in Ljubljana as a rural economy and transportation curator. I'm Lauren Muni. I live in Baltimore, Maryland, and I'm an artist. My name's Gamma Nacha. I'm a member of the International Agricultural Museum Association, and I find a really valuable organisation to be part of. I've spent many years here at Take Our Homestead in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales, Australia. Hello, I'm Deborah Reed, Curator of Agriculture and the Environment at the Henry Ford in Dearborn, Michigan, USA. Hello, my name is Nirupama Modwell. I uh, work and uh, live in Delhi with the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage as a heritage professional. Hi, I'm Pete Watson, Director of Howell Living History Farm in the Pleasant Valley Rural Historic District located in Hopewell Township, New Jersey, USA. Hello, bonjour. My name is Carolee Birchall. I'm the Director General of the Canada Agriculture and Food Museum. As the video has shown, you can see that AIMA right from the beginning had a very international membership. And this continues until today. When we, when we look at the numbers, you can see that AIMA is a rather small organization with around 100 um, institutional and individual members right now. But this international scope we have enables us to follow up on our goals I want to highlight now in the next couple of slides. Following up on the strategic plan of AIMA, one of the main objectives is to promote the cooperation between various categories of agricultural and rural life museums, as well as archives, collections, researchers or specialists, and also um, amateurs in these fields. Basically, AIMA wants to function as a vast networking platform and to encourage people to get together to think about shared interests to promote shared values and um, to scale it up internationally. Another main objective is to encourage these initiatives um, to interest experts, connoisseurs, as well as museums to a little bit more research focus exhibit activities as well as an active public engagement to promote the cause of agriculture in the world. When I think about other objectives, you could also state that it is one of the main objectives to encourage all these initiatives I've talked about um, on improving the training of young people, in particular when it comes to the exchange of these young people themselves, young professionals, um, uh, as well as knowledge transfer and skill on training and preservation. Lastly, I want to highlight that AIMA also wants to 
give a clear impression of what aquaculture means today in the 21st century as well as in the past what its values were and still are um, and this especially um, in the field of science and history we also want to fight against common cliches of agriculture and include research results to give us a new insight and um, a change of perspective to see agriculture today as a representative of agricultural museums on a global scale Naima also wants to take on responsibility and of course this has a lot to do with goals that have been laid out by the united nations for example everybody knows the sustainable development goals the so-called sdgs and many of the topics ema works about and within are along these lines of these sdg goals and you will see when i talk about our outreach program with our ema lectors that we are actively trying to um, step up and talk about these goals uh, on a broader scale Another important value we have, and we're following up on ICOM's core values here, is also the recognition of intellectual, cultural, and social diversity in the world. And when we are bringing together all these different museums, rural life museums, um, but also um, scientists and amateurs, it helps us to make this clear impression of all this diversity that brings us all together. Lastly, um, once more, um, it is an active approach on the conservation and continuation and also the communication of um, both intangible and tangible heritage when it comes to the world's natural and cultural heritage and all of this uh, in the regards of agriculture in a quite broad um, um, scale. One of the main activities or tools, so to speak, of AIMA or what AIMA has to offer are the Triennial Congresses AIMA had right from the beginning. As I have told you about in the promotional clip, the early history of AIMA was mainly focused on bringing together through this um, Congress researchers from the East and the West and especially giving the researchers from the East the possibility to um, exchange knowledge with um, uh, Western um, scientists. All of this, of course, has evolved a lot, and we were also able to gain a lot of experience when it comes to digital um, content and also during the pandemic have had our first digital um, SEMA Congress um, uh, hosted by the Maryland University of Reading. These Congresses always are aiming to publish proceedings as well. And uh, this has been done in the past on a regular basis and is also planned for the future. And um, I want to already highlight that um, we are very happy that our next Congress um, will take place in India. And I can um, only um, encourage you to have a look at our website. Um, it, is, it is going to be very exciting to um, include this Asian perspective even more in our approach within AIMA. AIMA's activities also include a very well-known um, international newsletter, which is issued on various occasions throughout the year, which collects news information as well as activities from members, uh, but also friends of AIMA um, on a global scale. And we have had the opportunity to also issue a very special um, newsletters focusing on specific problems like the pandemic. And we are very grateful that our uh, long year member, um, Cosette Griffith Kramer, has taken on responsibility there. 
Since the last couple of years, we also initiated a series of blogs which focus on agricultural topics, e.g. beekeeping, as well as animal traction and various other topics. We sometimes invite experts um, from within our um, advisory council, as well as um, scientific committee, uh, to um, bring in their expertise to a specific topic and then share it with the wider public. We also offer workshops every once in a while. Um, one of our most successful ones was again during the pandemic um, in which we focused on uh, the question coping with crises. Where we both invited also members um, of other organizations such as ALFEM to well share knowledge, share skills and expertise um, with on the broad public as well as um, other colleagues in the field. A new approach we started this year is the so-called email lecture series. Basically, this is one of the email lecture series we're now listening to. And we try to connect our active approach with public outreach, um, try to connect it with the World Days, like World Soil Day, World um, Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste. And we have um, had a series of, by now, four um, lectures, um, almost um, 60 uh, minutes long uh, each, which once more brought together a uh, broad um, variety of different researchers, colleagues, uh, as well as uh, others very important um, uh, for that field or that specific questions. All of this is published on our website as well as on our YouTube channel, for example, um, as well as social media, of course. Before I come to a close, I want to highlight one last thing, which is the committee work within our executive committee. Um, we try to bring together experts from various fields uh, in order to work on specific topics, um, such as um, art and agriculture, biotechnology, animals in museums, as well as draft animals um, or animal traction. We have a subcommittee working on implements and uh, strategic planning. This is exactly what is uh, EMA all about, meaning that this bringing together of expertise on an international scale, bringing together different perspectives from different countries and continents makes this work within the committee so fruitful and uh, a joy to attend. And we, when we look at the email lectures as well as the blogs, as well as other newsletter um, subjects, we see the work of the committees reflected in there. So I can only invite um, new members to get active um, within um, the committees uh, as well as the executive committee. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to the live discussions now. Thank you, Klaus, and I, I cannot uh, stress strongly enough the how uh, incredibly rich the Triennial Congress are uh, that AIMA puts together. And I, having visited um, Nirupima um, in India, I can uh, only imagine that the study trips that are involved and how they en engage the local communities and experts from historians to research. Um, it, it is definitely um, an in-person trip you will never forget. So I, I highly encourage you consider the Triennial Cong Congress. Uh, now is the time to put in questions in the chat. I know that we are at time. I thought I'd kick us off uh, with a question for Roland, Jim and Klaus. Um, knowing that all three of these uh, tremendous organizations uh, share really mission elements that relate to um, sharing knowledge, exchanging ideas, promoting skills. I'm, I'm wondering how you perhaps see these three organizations um, working together to promote thought leadership and, and cross-pollinate some of the expertise um, that, that would be found within each of your organizations. 
I'll start with uh, Roland. Uh, th well, uh, thank you very much for uh, for the question, and um, uh, we. I, I also like to add, I'm already a member of Alpha already for a number of years, so I I see what they're what they what they are doing. <laughs> um, I think it's important uh, one uh, on the one hand to be uh, to, to 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 be in touch, uh, the work with together in these live uh, things online. Uh, I was very happy with the Alpham conference being online last time, so I could actually join. Uh, travel costs are uh, prohibitive. Um, but meeting in person, I think, also between board members of, of different associations would help a lot uh, to get projects kicked off, uh, like the Year in the Field program uh, by, by Klaus Krop, which, which is an, an excellent initiative. And, and it also shows that you don't need to have uh, a large sums of uh, project money uh, to get something uh, going. And I think that's also a bit of a, uh, uh, an issue here. Uh, many of us uh, members are in Europe, other members are in other parts of the world. And although there may be funding for networking in Europe or network in the US or North America or networking in Asia, uh, it's difficult to find uh, resources for to, to support networking uh, on a global international uh, level. And, and um, there I, I, I see problems. On the other hand, um, I think we can overcome this problem because as you could see in the three presentations, we have a lot in common and also our way of thinking, I think about these subjects is, uh, is, is uh, linked quite well. Go off mute. Thank you, Roland. Uh, since you brought up year in the field, Klaus, would you like to answer next, and then we'll, we'll give the last word to Jim on that question. Thank you, Carly. Um, I can only add up on what uh, Roland already said. I think we learned a lot um, from the pandemic and learned that digital meetings are very important to bring people together from different time zones with no travel costs involved. So this is a perfect step that an email lecture right now is a perfect step one and uh, of course um, great ideas always um well give birth um at a glass of wine or a beer or whatever <laughs> um so the personal meetings are um as important as the digital ones but it's easier to get people on board um with the possibilities we have and when i think about um a topic a project um like the year in the field um we just have to think about a shared interest and build a project around it and then try to get everybody from each perspective and each organization on board. And then we have once more these resources I was just referring to, uh, to make this um, a great project and also to make a change, to um, make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. And for those that perhaps uh, were not aware, year in the field topic in 2022 was wheat, and we're coming up on 2023, which will be flax, which certainly is a topic that many of our sites are, are familiar with. Jim, did you have anything that you'd like to add as far as uh, helping to promote thought leadership across the organizations? You know, I, I think um, uh, both Roland uh, and Klaus have done a really great job of uh, describing exactly what my thoughts were. Um, you know, I was going to mention that we definitely learned from the pandemic that we have the opportunity to use a digital platform to be able to reach a wider audience. Um, you know, not only not only do we have the opportunity to, you know, connect with people globally, you know, but there the cost associated with in-person meetings and conferences can oftentimes affect those people living in our own communities. And so I think, you know, being able to provide that digital uh, or virtual option for people can removed, remove that cost barrier that can keep so many different people of uh, diversified cultures uh, and heritages from being able to participate. You know, we always have to be mindful of our mission to support those that are uh, working in uh, the museum industry and to address those issues that are affecting them. And just remember that the work that we do doesn't happen in a vacuum. So whatever the issues are that are currently affecting our society, they are also gonna be affecting our museums and our institutions. 
and we have to be um, both knowledgeable of those uh, issues and willing to stand up to uh, for the for change. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Jim. And, th and that's a perfect segue to uh, a, a great question that's come in from uh, Cosette Griffin Kramer. She you can always count on Cosette for a, a truth to power moment. Um, Cosette's asking. Um, where that that difference in um, approach between uh, Roland uh, with Exarch's um, free access to most content, or that that's certainly the way it was portrayed in in the video clip, uh, Jim compared to Alfam, which um, requires a membership to be able to access all of the resources available. Roland, perhaps did you want to share perhaps how that's uh, you, you've been able to resource that many free uh, that much free content? Well, to be honest, it's not so hard to get enough free content. Uh, it's just a decision we made very early in, in Exarch that anything we produce or anything we share from our conference, etc., is open access. And and uh, uh, some of our members are a number of years asked in a business meeting, why should I be a member? I get everything for free. I can I can better join academia.net or whatsoever. And we said you don't. It's not because you get something extra as a member. Yes, you do. You get a, a paper journal sent to you and you get a newsletter. Um, although the newsletter can, anybody can register for that. It's not that you get something extra as a member, but you join XI because you support the goals. That's a, that's our strategy. That's our way of thinking. Well, well said. Jim, did you want to add, uh, are there are there plans to share uh, additional content? Um, outside of the membership paywall? Yeah, thanks, Carrie Lee. And Cosette, thank you for your question. Um, you know, I know that there have been conversations that have been occurring for years, uh, especially with Alfam members that also attend the IEMA conferences and the XARC meetings. Um, there is a, an interest to be able to provide greater content. Uh, of course, there is a cost associated with uh, operating a all volunteer organization like Alfam, and so that is the main reason that uh, those resources have remained behind a paywall. Uh, but you know, certainly interested in having continued conversations to see what other opportunities might exist. Thank you, Jim. Roland, did you have something to add? Yeah, I I, I have to answer that of answer add to that that. Um, for example, our online conferences, uh, like one we had a year ago, uh, we have sponsors per hour. So there's about a sponsor pays, uh, usually a museum pays about 250 euro. Uh, uh, so we cover the costs. We always have some costs for, even if it's volunteers, we have some costs and that's covered by by museums. So let's say the, 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 the bigger members, so to say in our association uh, to, to do so. Thank you, Roland. Klaus, was there anything you wanted to add on, on that point of uh, open access or, or having more content available between memberships? I think everybody, uh, well, I think it's well covered. Great. Well, then I, I know we're getting uh, quite a bit over time, but I, I cannot pass up this great question from Ed and Kevin, who are wondering what the hope is of having a joint live or virtual con uh, conference. Uh, between the organizations, has has anyone uh, given some thought to that? Do the do our three presenters think that that could be an option? Well, I can certainly say that this meeting um, can be a, <laughs> a starting point of of that kind of uh, thought, and maybe um, it would be a great opportunity to well combine all these resources all the organizations have, and this is one thing I see the, the most potential in. If we are able to mobilize all of our membership, each organization, um, we're able to make the, the joint conference, for example, um, even bigger and give it more momentum. So I think um, definitely it's the right way to think along these lines of joining forces in every possible way. Thanks, Klaus. Jim or Roland? Yeah, um, you know, I, I certainly agree with Klaus um, exactly what he said. Um, this is the first step. You know, when Klaus reached out to uh, Roland and Kathy and I and, and others and, and talked about this idea of a collaboration between these three organizations, 
Um, you know, at, at first, you know, we thought, well, wow, what a great idea. How are we going to do that? You know, um, how do we jump in and, and, and take off running? But of course, we had to, to first bring each other together, bring our members together and uh, help to educate our members about what the different organizations do. So we've done that, right? And so what's next? What's the next opportunity? And having this virtual platform to be able to come together is certainly a wonderful idea uh, that I, I believe that our Alfam members would support. Thank you, Jim. Roland, anything to add? Yeah, I, th I think it's, um, I feel the three organizations or the board of the three organizations like linking pins indeed to between us and, and all the members on all three sides. And uh, I think the best next step would indeed be to, even if it's virtually, to bring the three boards uh, in, in one room with a bottle of wine or a bottle of beer and just <laughs> chat about what are the what are the, the options of doing things together. And if we have an an an, uh, an in person and real and a virtual meeting on Iceland uh, or um, in Canada, uh, which is close enough, I would say, uh, for, for many of our members. Um, I think that that's uh, that would certainly be good. On the one hand, meeting in uh, meeting virtually is is good, but meeting in person uh, is so much better if that's possible. Uh, thank you, Roland. And I'll I'll be a little cheeky and say if the meetings in in Canada, we'll we'll have to arm wrestle over that one bottle of beer. I'll I'll bring more beer. <laughs> Um, all right, I, I just we're we're quite a bit over time. There was another comment put into the chat from Ed Nizalowski uh, from the Bement Billings Farmstead regarding agroforestry. Um, I, I can't speak on behalf of uh, next year's conference. I know that the Alfam. Um, call for proposals closed uh, last night. I'm not sure if there will be any openings, but Ed, I think that sounds like a terrific idea for a uh, conference session, uh, whether it's at Alfam or perhaps on a virtual uh, conference coming up. Uh, certainly agroforestry, I would believe, would, would be pertinent to uh, all three of these organizations. Uh, certainly an opportunity. It's a great, a great example of a topic that would cross-pollinate. Um, there was a couple of other notes, just if everyone's seen uh, that there are some other um, virtual seminars coming up. And uh, yeah, I'm just having a look at the chat to clarify that when I say Amy is planning a seminar, I mean, to some of us are trying to arrange it. Yes. So um, thank you to everyone. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to, to keep an eye on the chat. I wanted to, again, thank Klaus uh, and Aima for organizing today's uh, webinar. Uh, my thanks to uh, Jim Lauderdale and Roland Partikoper uh, for sharing with us the, the mission and uh, some of the strategic direction that uh, their organizations are going. And I, I do intend uh, to play my part uh, in following up in, in the idea of, of having more discussions where we can cross pollinate and hopefully have some other sessions that we can all uh, share. Um, certainly uh, with, with the great content that's happening in, in all of our organizations, I think there's an opportunity for us to continue learning from each other. So with that, Klaus as host, was there anything that you'd like to say to close regarding the recording and when this might be available to share with others? Yeah, thank you, Carolee. And thank you for your great renovation of the meeting. and. Um, we will try to do our best to um, put all of this together as soon as possible. Um, therefore, I would say uh, in the old year, um, we will have the digital um, recording um, of this meeting available. And then, of course, try to um, distribute it through all possible channels of all um, organizations. Um, so um, our members especially um, have the chance to um, get that broader insight and um, realize um, how much skill and knowledge is actually involved in all of these three organizations. So thank you all for um, being part of this and for continuing this journey together. Thank you, everyone. Merci à vous tous. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Very good. Very, very interesting. Lots of overlap. <laughs>